Hi, everybody, and welcome to the show. Today, I have a special guest. Her name is Michelle Skiff, and I am so proud to have her on my show. She is a courageous woman, and she has an amazing story to share. Michelle, how are you doing today? Good, 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 good. Tell people a little bit about you. You now are a transgender woman and yes. married to a transgender woman. And Is that correct? That is correct, yes. And so tell me kind of like the beginning of your your life, how it started to go and when you started to notice, you know, you didn't feel comfortable in your body. Well, it, it, it's kind of hard. For me, it started when I was three years old. Okay. Um, and that's the first time I remember. Uh, it was just a little thing. It really was. It was... Um, uh, my sister was the only, my older sister was the only one of us that actually went to school. And so she would put on her dress and she would say, I'm ready to go to school. And I would do the same thing and say, I'm ready to go for, go to school. And, uh, of course at three years old, everybody just laughs and, and whatnot, even though, you know, I was a little bit serious. And then as, as I went through my life, I knew that, you know, Hey, I was different. I wanted to be a girl. And I didn't understand it because, you know, um, I am 61 years old. So that was the um, 60s and, and 70s. And there wasn't very much information out there at the time. Mm -hmm. So people who are like me who uh, are transgendered didn't know what they were. They, you, know, you didn't know what was going on except for if you did try to talk to somebody about it, they shut you down. Um, you know, you, you couldn't go up to uh, your father and say, you know what, I think I'm really a girl, not like you can now. Uh, you could, but, you know, that would mean punishment push-ups or something. You know, it, it just right. was not uh, uh, acceptable. Uh, you know, and, and in a lot of sense, you know, for people my age, uh, if you're not transgendered, it's it's still not acceptable to them. So yeah, um, it, 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 it makes it difficult. So what you do is is you hide it and then you do it in secret or dress up in secret to try to alleviate what you're feeling. Um, but then you're sneaking around and you feel terrible and you feel terrible about yourself. And you, so then you start, um, you don't socialize the way that you should when you're that age. You don't socialize with your, your family the way you should. Uh, you don't socialize with your friends the way you should. You, 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 you put yourself in your own uh, little prison basically. Um, and, and that I thought about too uh, for a long time as as I was going through um, this process in my head and accepting it for myself is I was building a cage for me. I was building my own little jail. Uh, when I was living by myself, I shut the door, shut the blinds, dress as myself, feel better. But then if somebody wanted to come over, oh, no, you can't come over. <laughs> you know, I can't tell you what I'm doing. Uh, you know, uh, so it was this whole, so you become antisocial almost, and, and, and it's hard on you. And it does catch up with you eventually. So you continued on, you went into the police force first or the Marines first? I, w I went into the Marine Corps first. I was, um, uh, I was a, a all-American in, in running uh, in the 10,000 meters and the, the 5,000 meters. And that took uh -huh. up a great deal of my time. Uh, I went to college. I had to have a bachelor's degree in physical education. Uh, and then from there, once I graduated, uh, uh, I was encouraged to go into the military by my parents. And, and, and I did. I took a commission in the Marine Corps. I was commissioned in 1981, and I became an airstrike controller. And I stayed in until on active duty until 1984. And then I was in the reserves until 1993. That's when I got my, um, <clears throat> my, uh, my honorable discharge. And so then you went into LAPD. Yeah, I went into LAPD in 1996. Um, and, uh, again, I joined at a, at a, at a good time. Uh, went through the Academy and, you know, uh, everybody goes out to patrol. So I worked patrol in uh, South Los Angeles and in Hollywood. Uh, I also spent um, two years uh, working in Hollywood Vice. Uh, and then after that, my career uh, went to detectives uh, where I worked uh, uh, 
in the LAPD abused child unit. And I did that for the last four years of my career. So all this time, like you're, you're in the Marines and it's a manly job in LAPD and you're in a manly position too. And how was that? What did that look like for you internally? Was it, it, it wasn't it wasn't bad because again I by that time I was a master of not telling anybody anything, um, and that's what you become. It it's a very difficult point because you, you're almost living two different lives. You're living you're living your private life and you're living your professional life, uh, and it, it, it's difficult. It, it really is because you want to tell your friends and your workmates, you know, who you are, but you're also afraid to do so, you know, because you don't know if you're going to get shunned or, or teased or, or whatever it is. It's, 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 it's not something that you can just blurt out and talk about. Right. And, uh, and that was in the nineties and, and early two thousands. I, so you, again, there's no release there for you. So you've basically got pressure in your, um, in your private life, and then, you know, you compound that by the pressure that, that you have on being a police officer and trying to be the be best police officer that you can be. And something had to give, and, and it did. <laughs> For me, it did. Uh, I ended up uh, going through a very, very difficult time where I was definitely heading down the, the wrong road. Um, what, and would, what did that look like? Uh, that was... Uh, Going through divorces, um, I had three divorces before this. You got married? Uh, you yep. Three, you said? Three, yes. Wow. Yeah. It, did you it, get married the first time? I'm sorry? Did you get married the first time? I got married the first time in 1981. Okay. Uh, that was basically my, uh, my college sweetheart. Okay. Um, and she knew who I was, but eventually she got tired of it. See, that's another thing too, is I don't blame any of my ex-wives. Well, there's one I do, but, <laughs> but, um, but you basically lie to them. You, they, you, th they think that you're a police officer and a Marine. You act like it. You talk like it. You walk the walk, you talk the talk, but all of a sudden now you're, you're a girl and you don't tell them at the beginning because that's no way to start off a relationship uh, with a, with a lady is, Oh, you know, you look nice, by the way, I'm really a girl too. You know, <laughs> uh, you, know you don't get any dates that way. So, so you, you lie and you do, you end up lying and it's not a good thing because then you fall in love and you get married for the same reasons everybody else does except for you lied. And if you're truly transgendered, you cannot keep that a secret. Yeah. Every single person who's transgendered, who has transitioned, has bought a whole bunch of clothes, been themselves, and thrown everything away uh, several times. And so you end up lying to, to people. And, and that also <laughs> goes on your... Um, uh, th th that also affects your psyche because you're... You want to be a good person, but you're not because you're a liar. And so it, it causes a lot of problems. That must be horrible. Yeah, it is. Like I said, you're locking yourself in a gilded cage is what you're doing. And, and it's, it's, it's pretty much that simple. And, and it affects every aspect of your life. Did you have uh, any children? Or? No, I never did have any children. Was that your decision or was it just the way things worked out? It's just the way things worked out. I, you know, um, I'm kind of thankful now that I didn't because uh, I, never, I never dealt with it uh, really until I was in my 50s. Um, I've been transitioned now, fully transitioned, uh, for about eight years. And um, I came out to everybody, you know, about nine years ago. <laughs> Basically, they were like, okay, that's fine. You know, we still love you, but we don't want to see it. So you, you still had to keep that part of it a secret. Um, and, and that, you know, it, it, it causes problems. It really does. I mean, um, uh, because when you 
finally do. Like I said, in my 40s, you could pretty much call it a, uh, a midlife crisis. Um, uh, and, and believe me, I was definitely going down the wrong road with alcohol, drugs, fights, you name it. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so you, so you, you, you want to <laughs> you be normal. So <laughs> what happens when you go through all of this stuff is you go, well, shoot, I must, must be an alcoholic. I must be, uh, you know, so I went to AA and I went to all those meetings and everything like that. And I found out, you know what, I could stop drinking and, and doing drugs and doing all that stuff really easily. I could do it for 90 days, six months. And I'm like, okay, but I'm still feeling this way. So this, so it wasn't the drugs and alcohol that's the problem. Uh, so what is it? <laughs> and finally, um, uh, you know, when I was 51 years old, uh, something came over me. And for me, that was God. Okay. For seriously, it was God. And, um, uh, you know, the, it was either, you know, Hey, continue going down this path and you can, uh, die of drugs and alcohol and, and not be happy, or you can take a chance. And, and that's what I did is I ended up taking a huge chance and I came out to everybody and I told everybody what I was going to do. Um, some people still don't talk to me for it, uh, you know, but they had to get used to the idea. You can't expect people to just snap their fingers and, and go. And there's a lot of things that you have to deal with because I'm thinking I'm two different people, but you know what? I have to adjust that thinking. I'm still the same person. I'm still an LAPD officer and I support LAPD. <laughs> I'll support them to my dying day. And I'm still a United States Marine. I'm still a manager in freight. I still ran marathons. I still climbed the trees that I climbed when I was a kid. I'm still a 49er football fan until the day I die. You know, all of those things. So you don't change who you are totally. You're just becoming more of the truth. You are just saying that, hey, you know what? I'm a female. All that stuff that you know of me, you know about me? That's still me. I haven't changed, but I'm happier now. <laughs> and I can move forward and I can have a life and I can be married and have a puppy and I can, I can do all the things um, outside so that everybody knows who I am. And that's the greatest thing about finally coming to that, uh, uh, really? that realization. Yeah, realization. It felt so bad that we live in a society where you have to cover up who you are if it's not mainstream, right. you know? Well, exactly. It's, it's people don't understand, don't understand it, you know? And that's why, you know, for me, it was God who brought me out of all of this. It really is. And um, so what, what ends up happening is you, 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 you do hide it, but that's because People don't really understand the game. This, you know, you're not doing this for some weird sexual fantasy type of thing. You know, it's, you're not doing this against God. You're doing it because God made you this way. I think that the, what the taboo attached to it is sex. I think that right. creates the problem because, you know, it boil, they, that's where their mind <laughs> Right. That's where their mind goes is it's about sex and has nothing to do with sex whatsoever. And matter of fact, that's how all of this e equality stuff comes on, which I have a problem with also is um, they think that this, you know, you're, you're, you're giving equal rights to somebody with some weird sex habits or something like that. And that's not it. It's not. It's, it's you're loving who you love. And you deserve the same rights as anybody else. And the way I explain it to people is, is very simple. What ends up happening is uh, when I first got out of the Marine or out of uh, when I first transitioned, okay, I was in the Marine Corps. I fought for our country. I served the city of Los Angeles for 12 years. Um, I did a lot of good things. You know, I did my part to, for the United States of America and I still will. And I always will. But, when Robin and I wanted to get married, uh, we couldn't do it. It was illegal. And so therefore we couldn't have the same tax breaks. We couldn't have anything, um, you know, that was related to, uh, 
to the privileges that you get for being married. Right. Okay, that, that wasn't right. That, that was definitely not right. Now, we got lucky and it got changed. But for a lot of people up to 2013, 2014, no, 2013 in California, uh, they couldn't get married. And so they wouldn't share the same, um, same uh, benefits that, that a straight couple would. Right. Okay. So then, you know, you have the part saying, well, you have to keep it out of the church. You have to do this and that. And the other thing, you know, you're trying to invade our space for, uh, for the church. And I'm like, no, you're not. You know, God loves all of us. And God created us differently. And uh, matter of fact, even in, in Romans 9, you know, God's the potter and he makes different dishes for different things. And you can't argue with the potter that his creation is bad. Right. So, so when Robin and I got married, you know, the straight community didn't know about it. We got married in our church with our friends, with our pastor, um, and <clears throat> with our family, you know, the ones that wanted to attend, you know, with our family. How did that affect the church, the Catholic church, or any church that is against gay marriage or any of those things? How did it affect any state government? How did it affect any straight person whatsoever that wasn't our friend and didn't want to go? Chances are none of them knew anything about it because we didn't invite them because they weren't our friends. So it comes down to that simple. You know, that's what the equal rights thing is. Nothing extra. If you're a straight couple, you go to church, you get married, you get your pastor in your church with your friends and your family, and nobody knows anything about it except for that little group right there, and it's between you and God. And the fact that you want to share your love with God, that's what you have to do. That's what everybody does. You know, that's the way God made us is to share our love, you know. And um, so anyways, that's kind of no, a long no. way of saying it. but <laughs> Oh, it's perfect. You, and you talk about being a Christian. And I know that there's a lot of uh, Christian sectors that do not agree mm-hmm. with who you are, what you do, being married to same sex, and you have a church that obviously accepts you, correct? Or yeah, no, correct. Uh, we we started off at um, at the Glory Center down in in Los Angeles, and uh, now we're a member of the Episcopalian Church, which is a pretty straight mainline church. Uh, and I'm a member of the vestry. Uh, Robin is a member of the the choir, and and we both do different ministries, and we both do a lot of things to help the people in our church and to help people outside our church. Uh, you know, we have backpack buddies that feeds um, uh, kids going to school. Uh, we have a uh, St. Paul's place which uh, feeds uh, the homeless on on Thursday nights, no Wednesday nights. Uh, so we have a lot of different uh, charities that we work for. We're both involved in it. Uh, again, I'm a, I'm a vestry member, so I'm the one that helps decide where the money goes and who it goes to, which is right up my alley because I love doing that sort of thing. Right. Um, and I want to set a good example, and Robin and I are both agree, agree on this. We go to work. We get jobs. We dress normally, you know, best we can. Um, we, we do our laundry every single week. We, we go grocery shopping every week together. We hold hands in public, but we don't do anything like making out in front of everybody. Uh, and we go to church every Sunday. Mm-hmm. We don't miss work. We do the best we can. We, we, we pay our taxes. We're the best Americans that we can. And I think that's the way that, that, um, <clears throat> that people are transgendered and uh, people who are, are in a, in a gay relationship, whether they're married or boyfriend, boyfriend, girlfriend, girlfriend. I think that's how we, we go, we move forward. Right. We don't let these people who, you know, uh, I, I don't want somebody that's out in the middle of public wearing pink panties that, you know, representing that I'm transgendered and I should get special stuff. That's not what anybody's saying. And it drives me nuts. It really does. Um, so do you, what you're saying, mm-hmm. I think it, right. it's a bad stereotype for transgenders, for gay people, right? Well, well the, the expression for the, for the pride parades and that sort of thing, that, that's fine. That's, it's a parade. Uh, okay. You know, our church, we used to um, uh, 
try to get more people who are LGBT into our church, um, into the Glory Center, so that they get the love they need and the support and, and, and get God in their lives. Uh, we used to wear T-shirts, or they still do, uh, that says free hugs. And we would all be in the Pride Parade, and we'd, we would give everybody out there a hug that needed a hug. And, and give them, um, you know, little things for our church. Hey, you know, come to our church. You know, we'll help you out. You know, uh, you know we love you. We accept you. You know, that, that sort of thing. So a pride parade, is, it's different than politics. You know, it's different than, um, you know, showing up in the Capitol building or something like that. that that's a time for expression. It's a, it's a time for pride. It's a time for joy. It's a time to, you know, dress up a little bit, be a little bit outrageous, have some fun, okay. you know. But, but as far as um, when it comes down to the making of the, of the, of the uh, laws to, to create equality, the making of the laws that um, are going to allow – people not to have to grow up like me and my wife did when we were young uh, and it's already making an effect. Those have to be done in a professional environment by professional people. Right. Uh, You know, you were talking about being young in the sixties and there was a, there was a female or transgender um, tennis player. Do you remember that? Yeah. Renee Richards. Yeah. And what did you think about that? Did you like, Oh, wow. Yes, I did, as a matter of fact, and she had a book out called Second Serve. But and now here's how I, I, I knew I wasn't the only person out there because I used to go to the library every single week and try to check that book out, and it was always checked out. I never got to read it because it was always checked out. Wow. That's how I knew. I said, you know what? There's got to be more people than me because – who, what macho guy or, or girl is going to check out that book if they weren't having the same feelings as I was? That book was always checked out of the library. Right. See, yeah. And so that was kind of really, um, you know, she was a pioneer and brave. I mean, that time period, you know, we have Caitlyn Jenner now, who they mm-hmm. say was the pioneer, you know, but really Renee Richards was she was the pioneer. She did it before anybody that we know of, right? Right. As, as far as in, in the public eye, absolutely. Well, Michelle, thank you so much for being okay. here and courageous and, you know, uh, just you talking about your struggles and I, I am sure it's going to help people immensely, help them get to the point of being free. And I thank you. So. Absolutely. Uh, good. All right. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye.